I read there for us the, the scripture lesson now from the first uh, uh, four verses of the first letter to John, the first epistle of John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we saw it, and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ, and we are writing this that our joy may be complete. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word and guide us as we study it together at this time. I won't take any significant time for introductory matters since there's no serious question but that this letter was written by the beloved apostle, the author of the fourth gospel, and the other two letters that go by his name as well as the last book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation. Constantly referred to that way in the early church and so much incidental testimony that to my knowledge there's never been any serious contesting of its authenticity. And as I mentioned this morning, as some of you who were here at that time may remember, that it fits so well with the fourth gospel that it almost looks as if it were a paraphrase of some places. You'll recognize time and again a parallelism of thought that again suggests authenticity of the most immediate uh, character. So we won't take any time on the uh, generally accepted fact that this is a letter written by the Apostle John late in the first uh, uh, century, after the Christian church had been well launched. I'm, uh, uh, I'm sure you're all aware of the fact that some British scholars a few years ago produced a book entitled The Myth of God incarnate. And of course, that Britain and all Christians there, and because the men who wrote the book were prestigious scholars and argued the thing with a great deal of academic competence and expertise that shocked the whole religious and Christian world. It suggests that the central verity of the Christian religion that Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, God with us, the fullness of the Godhead dwelling bodily, was a myth and not a reality at all, coming from professed Christians uh, who are trying to represent Christianity, even while considering the heart of Christianity as a myth. It provoked a reply by a number of conservative evangelical British scholars under the edit editorship of Michael Green, entitled The Truth of God. In common. Now, in a certain sense, we're playing a little bit on the, this title and a series of the title of our little series, which is, of course, a rejection of this that is based on this particular volume is in the sense of affirming its position and uh, building on it. The title of our little series would be Living with God in Common, which I think is the theme of this epistle, and especially the first chapters that we'll be dealing with, living with God incarnate. I may mention at the outset that the whole idea of having communion with God incarnate may sound extreme even to the most evangelical of persons. You think of God having been incarnate, but now since Christ is resurrected and ascended, into glory, you don't think of living with him whom you do not see and whom you do not have communion with visibly. And yet, it is true, theologically speaking, that if you're living with Christ, you are living with God incarnate. Because Christ, once he became incarnate, remains incarnate forever. He never laid aside his humanity or even his body. And he dwells now 
at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. He's going to appear later in the clouds of heaven in his glorified humanity, but the Spirit of Christ, with whom we have communion with Christ, is, of course, the Spirit of God incarnate. As the Catechism says, the only Redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ, who, being the eternal Son of God, became man, and so was and continues to be God and man in two distinct natures, one person forever. So he is evermore the God man. And if we know him at all, we know him as indeed the God man, and we are living with God in turn. And as I see, as you look at these verses, surely that's the step of this opening chapter of the uh, epistle here. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, seen, touched, and so on. I want to call your attention to the way the epistle begins. That which was from the beginning. And it may well be useful to get the impact of that, which is stated so briefly and uh, in such a rather cryptic form that it, it impacts as an affirmation of the deity might escape you if you didn't notice closely. But I'll tell you now, I'll try to prove as we move along, that this expression, that which was from the beginning, is a reference to the deity. But let me uh, uh, look at some other texts to help us appreciate that fact. You all know Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, God created. In the, the heavens and the earth. But in the beginning, God. You all know the beginning of the fourth gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was. God. In the beginning was the Word, the word was, with, uh, the word was with God, and the Word was God, or literally God was the Word. The emphasis there is on the deity of the Word. A little later, in that first chapter of the Gospel according to John, we remember that it said, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that has been made. So, you have a rather strict parallelism here. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning was the Word. Clearly the Lord God Christ, through whom all things were made, and without whom there was nothing made that was made. Now, uh, this is Genesis 1, and this is John 1, and now let's take a look for a moment at Philippians 1, before we glance at first John 1, all of which have a very similar uh, accent to them, but Philipp I mean, um, I don't mean Philippians 1, I mean Colossians 1. Colossians 1 has a, uh, a need for a little greater attention. One fifteen, it reads this way. He, speaking of course of Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things were created, in heaven and in earth. Now you see in that Colossians passage, the Apostle Paul is indicating in three different ways the deity of Jesus Christ. One, he is called the image of the invisible God. Some of you who are here this morning remember we were mentioning that as a significance of his being called the Son. God so loved the world that he gave his only, or his unique, his only begotten Son, who is just like him, an eternal being. Now here in Philippians, what's being indicated is that he is the very image. We use to, sometimes use the expression, the spitting image. He is exactly the image of the Father. He too is very God and very God. That's what that term, image, in that close connection with invisible God calls to our attention. When it says the firstborn of all creation, you can see all the Jehovah's Witnesses going off the target immediately. Because that rather infelicitous translation does suggest that this one who's called the image of the invisible God was what the Jehovah's Witnesses think he was, namely, the very firstborn of all the creatures. And you have to admit 
at first glance, and their New World Translation, of course, uh, spells this out in such a way that there's no other way of understanding it. If you didn't know uh, the text of which it was a translation, that the first word of all creation means that this image of God is the first one to have been created by God. So you're really immediately alerted to the fact that that is not what is meant. He is called the image of the invisible God. Well, if he's a very smitten image of the invisible God, if he's very God of very God, he is not a creature himself. He's not the firstborn of all the creation in the sense that he has the list of all those whom God made. He is unmade. He is the Son. He is the very image of the eternal one. And what the language there really means when it says the firstborn of all creation as the Shakespeare translates it, he is the firstborn before all creation. It's actually what it means. Firstborn, as we've indicated this morning, means eternally born, because remember, that which is born, that which is born, is like the begetter, or the one who causes him to uh, be born, and in this particular case, begotten, is like Together, it's a little difficult sometimes to write and talk at the same time, so don't be too misled by what I'm writing. You pay more attention to what I'm saying, but uh, uh, the writing is, uh, is meant to make it a little clearer and sometimes confuse it. The begotten is like the begetter, is what we're saying. That's what the significance of the term son is. And so it is here that this one who is uh, not called a son in this case, but an atone or an image or an identical likeness of the invisible God, not of any creature and so on. In this passage is represented as the eternally begotten, who is indeed the source of the whole creation. And that isn't immediately clear in this phrase, the first word of all creation. It becomes clear in the next phrase. For in him all things were He's not a creature. He is the one by whom all things were created. Now, if you put this together, you realize there's a striking similarity here, uh, this Colossians 1 with the others. In the beginning, God created, and in certain sense, in the beginning, the Word created. Here, in the beginning, the image is the creator, the one by whom the whole world is made. What you realize is that the second person of the Godhead, the eternal Son, Jesus Christ, here referred to in Genesis 1 as just God, in John 1 as Logos or Word, in Colossians 1 as Acon or uh, Image, is none other than the Creator, apart from whom nothing was made, who made all things that have been made. In other words, what the Bible is intimating to us is something which makes the apostles seem somewhat dubious in its original phrasing. When it says, I believe in God the Father, Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, where strictly speaking, the Bible tends to indicate that it's the Son who is the Maker of heaven and earth, at least in these uh, passages here. The general theological tradition has been, of course, that the first, first person of the God is the Creator. And the second person is the Redeemer. And the third person, the Holy Spirit, is the Sanctifier. And of course, there is a certain likeness about that. That is, attributing the original creative activity to the first person of the Godhead. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. But when you find three explicit statements which particularly attribute the creation, not to the first, but to the second person, who are made to think a little bit more carefully at what the church must mean when she refers to the first person, God the Father Almighty, as the maker of heaven and earth, is that it was his plan or his intention. Now, the agent by whom he did it was the second person of the Godhead. And the one who is strictly the Creator is the one who is strictly the Redeemer. 
If I had more time this evening, I could suggest something I'll throw out as an idea that you may wish to develop. Christ is particularly the Creator because He's the Redeemer. As a Redeemer of God's elect, He is the one who brings them into being in the first place. And He creates this world from the world for the redemption of people from it. So that the creative role of the second person is preliminary to and a basis for the redemptive role of the first person. But to bring all this to bear, from Genesis 1 and John 1 and Colossians 1 to 1 John 1, I want to call to your attention the significance of this phrase, that, that which was from the beginning. That why is a timeless word that itself uh, is a cue to the fact that it is not that which was made from the beginning, that which simply exists and though it's in the past and continuing tense rather than a present such as I am that I am, it is nevertheless a continuing verb which immediately suggests to us eternal existence. The Greeks have a word for explaining the identical rather than aim, for example, which is to say that which began to be in the beginning. And they were trying to say that this person about whom they're going to be speaking actually was brought into being as a first in the creation at the very beginning. They have a word to express that unambiguously. They don't use that word, but rather use a word that suggests timeless existence. So what is actually being said here is that which, and we'll realize later on it's a person, so that person who was at the very beginning, who wasn't brought into being, at the beginning, he is the one who brings beginnings into existence. And this is we have noticed, in the beginning God created. The word was with God, and by him were all things made that were made, and without him was nothing made that has been made. He who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, is the one in whom the creation comes into existence. So what John is undoubtedly suggesting to us here and anybody familiar with the Old and the New Testament would no doubt pick up the innuendo that this person whom he's going to describe in more fullness later on is himself an eternal being who is the beginner of the beginning. He is the one who brings all things into existence and starts the sequence from which change and time with which we are familiar becomes. Now... The thrust of First John, however, is not that this is an eternal being. The emphasis, as we sense in this first chapter of the epistle, is not that, but rather that that which was from the beginning, we have heard with our ears, we have seen with our eyes, we have touched with these hands. In other words, you have God, as it were, coming out of the invisible, intangible, inaudible, eternity, not only into our history as an influence or a force or a presence, but in the concrete form of a visible, audible, tangible humanity. That's the tremendous affirmation of this first uh, verse of the great epistle of John here, that the eternal one, they're almost, you can see they're almost stupefied by it. They're, they're incredible about it. You can almost feel him saying, I couldn't believe it myself. I know how difficult it's going to be for you people who hear these things, and especially 2,000 years later, but I assure you that that one who was eternal was the one we saw with these eyes and heard with these ears and touched with these hands. That's how real and concrete it is. And in verses that I don't write down here, they reiterate that again, as if to say to the people, I know it's stupendous, I know it's unbelievable, I know you can't uh, possibly accept what we're saying if you didn't realize that we are as incredulous about it as you are, we are as stupefied by the event as you could be, but we have seen it, we have heard it, we have touched it. That who is that one who is actually from the beginning. And then he mentions that that's concerning the, the word of life, and here I put the, the Greek word there just to remind you that he uses the same term, Lagos, translated word that occurs in the much better known first chapter of the fourth gospel. In the beginning was the Lagos. 
And the Logos was with Theia, God. And Theia was the Logos. And God was the Word. And here, as I say, right in this passage, you've already sensed it. If you've known the fourth gospel, you realize, without using the name of Jesus Christ at all, this John is talking about him when he talks about that one who was from the beginning and the very beginner of all things, who is uh, the word that that is none other than the Logos of Jesus Christ. He also introduces who is Jesus Christ. He also introduces the fact that he was life. Now here I think you have a rather interesting uh, transition from the splendor of it all and the eternality of Jesus Christ becoming utterly concrete, visible, audible, and tangible in human nature to the point where it reached those who first saw him and you and me who hear about him through them. That is, in the form of life. The life which was Christ was pulsing through the being of John when he wrote these words. This wasn't just a tremendous experience. That is, it were left you awestruck and wonderstruck by it all, this actually transformed you. This got inside you. This made a new creature of you. This was not just an encounter with a sublime. This was a transformation of your very being. So his life was yours. That life was made manifest. And here he comes back. We saw it, and we testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father. I think the movement that we have here in this uh, movement from the eternal one who becomes visible and tangible and audible uh, to life in the apostles is this. They then, being persuaded of that, do proclaim. So I say the first step that's uh, happening here is the manifestation of God Incarnate. Then comes the proclamation of that fact. They who have encountered God in the flesh and who have been transformed and made alive by him, they now proclaim him to their readers and through their readers to us. Those of you who are familiar with contemporary theology, and as a historian, when I say contemporary, it means the last, say, 50 years. It may not be the way you use it. No, there's a good deal of talk about the kerygma and the kerygmatic gospel. It's a declaration that Christianity, as J. Gresham Machen once said, is not good views, though it does include that, but good views. That is, it is an event that has to be declared or proclaim. There's proof of it, there's evidence for it, and they're prepared to show you these things weren't done in the corner and to give a reason for the hope that's within them, but they are not just explaining to you the golden rule and indicating that you ought to turn the other cheek and go the second mile and be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, though certainly that's a part of the message, but the center of the message is not a set of ideals, however perfect they may be, embodied perfectly in Jesus Christ, but news that God himself has entered human flesh and has actually brought us life through the incarnate one. So the movement here is from the manifestation of God in human flesh, the fullness of the Godhead dwelling bodily, and encountering the apostles, one of whom is the inspired writer of this particular record, to proclaim what he has seen. Why? To proclaim to the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, the apostles, who had been uh, proclaimed. Now, why is that? Well, they're proclaiming that also to you. That's the readers, of course, and manifestly we are many steps removed, but we also are the readers, and this was meant not only for Christ's sheep of that day, but as he said in his farewell discourse, I have many other sheep who are to be brought, and thank his name, we are among those, and so this proclamation is to come to you here and ask with uh, tonight, as well as to the readers of the epistle to whom it was first written. Uh, see, that's the, that's the point, the proclamation also to you 
so that you may have fellowship with us. This is the next step in this. The great event takes place in the lives of the apostles. They are set on fire, they are made alive, and they are sent out on a world mission to proclaim the message, and that is in order that you, we, may have fellowship with him, in order that the church, shall I put it that way, the church may come into being. The church may be, that is, that through the witness of the apostles, who together with the prophets are said to be the foundation of the church, Christ is himself the ultimate foundation, but the immediate foundation are the apostles and the prophets, and the early church people believed through them, and they were built up on them, and they had fellowship in them, and they gave strict, strict heed, as we still do today, to the apostolic doctrine, and that's the test of a person who is a true Christian, that he accepts the proclamation of the gospel which Jesus Christ first made to them, whom they, as they saw him and heard him and actually touched him and had uh, communion uh, with them. This, uh, the manifestation comes, and from that the proclamation, and through the proclamation, then and now, the church comes into existence. I may say, if there's anybody here, for example, who is a stranger to the covenant of Israel, and who is not in God, then the invitation is to you. The proclamation is to you. And when you believe the apostolic message, you have, as they say here, the very fellowship with God that they have had. They said, give this message so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. You see, through this tremendous incarnation, the fellowship is set up with the apostles who then are commissioned to proclaim it, and the church comes into being as a group of individuals who believe the apostolic proclamation and themselves have fellowship with the apostles and they have fellowship with the Father. So that everyone here who truly believes the apostolic message has fellowship with the apostles, has communion with the saints, and they have thereby fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now let me... Uh, call your attention to this rather interesting uh, quirk at the end of the section we're looking at today. And those of you who have a, a King James with you will notice particularly that the RSV has a surprising uh, shift there from uh, your to our. The, uh, this is one of the things I may like to see about this epistle. It's full of surprises. It, uh, it comes on you suddenly in a way you never expected. And this is one of the first and most uh, startling of the surprises in this letter, that the apostles tell all this about the manifestation of the Son of God, the proclamation, the fellowship with God, and fellowship with the church, and so on. In order that, they do all that in order, not that your joy should be complete, but that our joy should be complete. You can see why the King James uh, translators uh, actually did think it meant uh, sure. That is, what are you expecting here? Here these people have been enc encountered by God incarnate. Their doubts have been overcome by the immediate presence of visible, tangible, audible God incarnate who was from beginning. Now they are proclaiming it to us in order that we might enter into the fellowship. What would you expect them to say? In order that your joy might be fulfilled. They've, after all, had fellowship with God. And because of that fellowship which they have, they proclaim the message to us, and we, believing the message, have fellowship with them, who have fellowship with God, so we have fellowship with God. And you would expect them to say, we have done all this, we've proclaimed all this to you, so that you will have fellowship, and our, that your joy will be complete also, as ours is. And instead of that, they say, that our joy may be complete. We proclaim it to you that you may have fellowship, not that your joy may be complete, but that our joy may be complete. As I say, it's so surprising, it's probably what explains the mistake that was made back in 1611 when the great uh, West, uh, divines uh, made the translation called the King James and wrote the word your rather than our, which it should be. You know, even in the English, of course, it's easy to confuse those two words. They're identical last three letters, 
Now, if you missed this, of course, you could easily make that mistake. In Greek, it's even easier to make the mistake because the word is humon and hamon. They're both four letters. There's just a slight difference between one of those letters that makes it your or our. So it's an easy mistake to make when you're transcribing. That's the reason the scribes were usually very careful so as to copy not word for word, but letter for letter to prevent any mistakes like that. But they were human and they were tired at times and they could make mistakes, especially if they were anticipating something other. Here you've had this, you've had this kind of experience where you literally think you see something because you were expecting to see it. When you reflect about it, you know you didn't really see that. But it looked enough like that that given your anticipation of it, it was enough to convince you at first that you had seen it. The psychological expectation of something can very definitely affect the way in which you apprehend it. And I have a feeling that anybody following this uh, uh, development here would so naturally expect it to end with a statement, we proclaim this to you so that your joy would be complete, that they may very easily not have noticed that that was a hamon rather than a humon, a our rather than your. This, uh, you know, we, uh, we draw up a brief for inerrant scripture not for inerrant transcription or inerrant translation. There can be mistakes. Copyists can sometimes confuse if they're careless. Humon with Hamon, or they can mistranslate, and so on. The only thing that is inerrant is the original autographer. We have to go back to it. And when we try the manuscripts, we find the support is for our rather than your. And one reason, or two reasons I tend to use the RSV, not because it's the best translation, it's just it's frightfully convenient. I can put the whole Bible in my pocket in this form, and none of the other translations have it quite as, as convenient as that. But with respect to the King James, which is incomparably superior to it from the standpoint of literature and familiarity and grandeur, and in some cases in translation as well, but generally speaking, it makes uh, slight improvements where they can be made, and this is the type of place where it would be. While I'm on this one subject, I'll give you one other illustration of what I mean. In Christ's Sermon on the Mount, where he says, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause is in danger of the judgment, you'll read in the Revised Standard Version that it drops the expression without a cause and simply says, whoever has Christ say, whoever is angry with his brother is in danger of the judgment. There's no question that that's what Christ said. Whoever is angry with his brother is in danger of the judgment. That, without a cause, crept in in the course of transcription. We know that by manuscript evidence. Now, don't be disturbed by this, because these are always peripheral matters. I'm telling it to you so as to relieve any disturbance, unless you read an article such as appeared in Look magazine some years ago when it was still extant, and so on, to the effect that there are 200,000 variations in the Bible. That's as ridiculous a piece of nonsense as possible. The variations are variations in spelling or little things like that that have no significance whatever, and that where there are variances of some more substance, you can usually trace how they came about. My guess about how this mistake came in the Sermon on the Mount, so that we read in the King James, Christ saying, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause is in danger of the judgment. This is my guess. It's an educated guess, but it's a guess, and it can be very wrong. I wasn't there when that original scribe made that insertion. But my guess would be this. He's reading this statement of Jesus Christ, indubitable, the original Greek, and so on, and saying to himself what he ought not to be saying to himself as a scribe, but he apparently couldn't resist the temptation. When Jesus said, he who is angry with his brother is in danger of the judgment, he meant that whoever is angry without a cause is in danger of the judgment. I agree with it. I'm sure that that's what our Lord meant. But then he had the audacity to make it easier for you to read it and understand it to take upon himself the job of interpreter, which should have been left to Pastor Graham and other individuals. That's what they go to seminary for. That's what they train for. That's the reason they preach sermons and to, to you about this sort of thing. He felt that he himself would do, not the transcribing, but the actual interpreting and insert something into Christ's mouth, which he never said which undoubtedly, in my opinion, he did mean. Jesus never condemns anger, period. Somebody asked me just the other day, not in connection with this at all, how do you, how do you uh, harmonize somebody to me 
That wasn't of the retreat, I don't think, was it? Uh, I don't think it was, Tom, at the retreat. But it was very recent, the last few days. I mean, how do you, how do you uh, harmonize to somebody to me uh, the statement of Jesus, uh, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause in danger of the judgment, and Paul's commandment in Ephesians, be ye angry. Be ye angry. Well, you see, somebody was hung up on that particular thing. Well, what Christ meant was, whoever is angry without a cause is condemnable. Paul is talking about a legitimate anger. Be ye angry, he says, and sin not. It's a dangerous virtue. It's very easy to sin once you start on an anger path. And so he says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. And I'm amused by a good many people who think that what that means is, it's all right to be angry in the daytime. But see, it doesn't last until the sunset. So on. Now, how silly can you get? But the passage means is, see to it that that legitimate anger, which is absolutely necessary, never turns over into uncontrollable orge, wrath, as it's very liable to do. You've got to watch that. Be properly angry, but don't be inordinately wrathful. Be ye angry, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. But my point is, getting back to this matter of textual detail, I don't think we'll have to go into any more of that during this little series here, but I want you to notice it in connection with this. Probably some scribe rightly concluding that Jesus meant when he said, whoever is angry with his brother is in danger of the judgment, and whoever is angry without a cause. But Jesus didn't say that. He may have meant it. Now, my guess here is that this scribe just was building up to a psychological momentum which would have the apostles saying, this wonderful fellowship which we have, we have to declare to you so that you can enter our fellowship with the Father and with the Son and that your joy will be complete. And it is somewhat of a letdown as well as a surprise to see that they've got a vested self-interest in the whole matter and they're declaring it all so that their joy will be complete. So that I, but that's what it says. And on that, I want, to, uh, I want to conclude this evening. This is the truth, and it's a profound truth, even though it's a somewhat startling and surprising truth, that uh, your joy now, uh, as a witness, as a witness, Christian joy can come to you only as you share with others. And no tr truer of the apostles than it is of you, or no truer of you than it is of the apostles, that fair joy could not be complete without sharing it with us. Summer conferences, you know, the kids are always asking, missionary conferences especially, like New Wilmington, they're always asking, they used to ask especially, what will happen to the heathen if they never hear the gospel? What will happen to the heathen if they never hear the gospel? Well, a great Baptist theologian named A.H. Strong once said, the real question is not what will happen to the heathen if they never hear the gospel, but what will happen to you if the heathen never hear the gospel? Well, they'll perish in their sins because there's none other name given under heaven than the name of Jesus Christ. And if you don't get that to them, there's no other option for them but to die in their sins. But what do you think can happen to you if you have an opportunity to share this with other persons and don't do it? Your joy is going to be complete. It's got to be a shared joy. And that's true even of the apostles. And their joy couldn't be complete. Even though they had an encounter with the Son of God, even though they're telling us by divine inspiration of the fellowship they have with God through it, and proclaiming to us the way by which we may have it also, and even though when we do enter this fellowship, we have fellowship with God, the Father and the Son, and our joy, your joy is made complete, but, what they're saying here is, that's true of ours too, and it wouldn't be complete, and neither will yours uh, be complete. Now, may I say just a word about the way the thing moves, the way the epistle moves for the uh, next three sections that we will be uh, looking at, and then I'll throw this open to your, um, to your questions. This is an invitation, you see, for us to enter into the fellowship of the apostles, which fellowship is with none other than God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, there are... In the verses which follow that we look at tomorrow night, you'll notice the first false response called today antinomianism. And then in the passage which we look at Tuesday night, which comes next, you'll see the second false response, which is called today 
perfectionism. And then in the passage, in the beginning of uh, the second chapter, with which we conclude our little series, the apostle gives us the true response on our part. Here is the declaration of the fact, and we are all invited to enter into the fellowship with the apostles, and through them with the Father and with his Son, Jesus. But if you respond in a certain way, the response is fatally wrong. If you respond in a way of fancying that since Christ is offered as Savior, you can continue in your sins, that will destroy you. If reacting to that entirely in the opposite direction, you think your response is so perfect that you are without sin, that too will destroy you. The only way in which you can properly respond will be indicated at the beginning of the second chapter. But tomorrow night we will look at those who say they have fellowship with the Father and yet walk in darkness and of whom John says they are liars and the truth is not in them. This is a widespread problem in evangelical circles today and the apostles' statement about that response is very, very firm and uh, negative and we want by all means to avoid it but first of all we've got to examine it. and we'll anticipate it a little bit in the afternoon discussion on justification. But now questions are from the floor, please. Anything that you want to ask, you can overcome the inhibitions of speaking and rather than just listening in the sanctuary. That's one of the uh, little disadvantages of, uh, of it being the sanctuary, but uh, we are having a teaching session here, and you may never have heard your voice out loud in the sanctuary, but only the pastors or some other visiting preacher such as myself. But uh, we're having an informal matter here, so feel free, please, to raise any question about anything that I've mentioned here or at the retreat, for that matter. But let's stay within that order. If you have other questions, save those for the man.